recall that we are just discussing pressure and uh, shear and that those uh, stresses give rise to all the forces and moments. And, and just by way of review, just to name some of the common forces and moments we care about, uh, here's an airfoil and I've drawn some forces. Remember that lift is always defined perpendicular to the free stream direction. So here's free stream, whereas drag is uh, in the direction of the free stream. And then the normal force is gonna be perpendicular to some reference line, in this case, a cord line for an airfoil, but some uh, reference line of the body. And then usually we'll call this the axial or tangential force that's along that axis. Okay, and these are, uh, you know, we can switch from normal to axial to lift and drag. Of course, this is just a, you know, given, this is just a coordinate rotation, right? We know this angle and we can just rotate these just based on knowing the angle, uh, which in this case would be actually be the uh, angle of attack. Um, so, uh, well, I guess I should draw the angle of attack. Yeah, I guess that's okay. So uh, recall that um, we use non-dimensional quantities uh, a lot in fluids and aerodynamics. Um, and the reason for this is many. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some more uh, detailed reasons the next time, but or a couple of times. But just briefly, uh, one reason is they allow us to represent quantities it could cover many scales across a more universal range, right? So you could tell me some value of pressure, some value of lift, right, in Newtons or in Pascals, and it wouldn't really have much meaning because I wouldn't know is that big or small. I'd have no context. But if you told me the lift coefficient was one or the pressure coefficient was minus two or, or whatever the case may be, uh, those mean something, right? I know if that's big or small because these are, are universal numbers, you know, the same with the drag coefficient, pitching moment coefficient, Reynolds number, Mach number, we have all sorts of these. Um, just for a quick review, uh, lift coefficient, and I'm gonna do the 3D ones. You should keep in mind that's the difference between like 3D lift coefficient and 2D, right? Whether I'm talking about like say a full vehicle versus just a 2D airflow or something, but I'm gonna just show the 3D, Review the 2D if, if you haven't seen this. Uh, for 3D, we take a force and we divide by a force. We use the uh, dynamic pressure times an area. And uh, this is just by convention. Dynamic pressure is one half rho V squared. Right, we kind of saw this last time. And then S is a cross-sectional area. That's just convention that's used S to represent area. Um, and it could really be anything, right? You just have to have an agreed upon convention. Typically for streamlined vehicles, we we'll often use like a projected or planned form area. Whereas for blunt objects, we often use a cross-sectional area just because in those respective cases, those are the um, areas that are most relevant in terms of scaling, right? Because the, the blunt bodies, the cross-sectional area is gonna kind of dominate the drag. Whereas for a flat body, it's kind of that projected area. Um, and then drag similarly, Right, drag coefficient. And then, uh, you know, other force coefficients look the same. And then mo uh, moment coefficients, like say a pitching moment, uh, it will look mostly the same, but remember a moment now has an extra unit of length on the top. So we need an extra one on the bottom. And so we need some sort of length. C might be a typical one, like a chord length, a meter down the chord. Uh, but, you know, again, this is something that needs to be specified. It's a convention for, uh, the object at hand. So when you go look up drag coefficients, for example, you'll always see the areas defined as well because it's kind of meaningless without it. You won't know what is used for that case. So, so they always have to define it. All right, so let's go back to our discussion. We were talking about how, say this airfoil here has a lot of pressure, or sorry, the cylinder has a lot of pressure drag, whereas this airfoil does not. Let's examine that a little more closely. So let's think about a cylinder here. This is an idealized case where just for the moment, get rid of viscosity. Uh, and, and so um, no viscosity at all. It's inviscid. We're gonna start, uh, we're gonna plot. Actually, let me draw this out here on this. Uh, this is theta, this angle here, right? And we're gonna draw this from zero over here to pi. 
Um, and what we're plotting is the pressure coefficient. That's another non-dimensional quantity. So pressure coefficient is just the gauge pressure, right? Because it's the differences in pressure that matter divided by the dynamic pressure, right? The same dynamic pressure we just saw. Okay, so this is a non-dimensional pressure coefficient. And just for interest, right, for a cylinder, this starts at one and it goes down to minus three, right? So these are universal numbers here. Right, so the pressure and actually the pressure coefficient is one for stagnation of every uh, incompressible uh, body, but which a cylinder is one. Okay, so we start at one high pressure that corresponds to this point right here, right? The stagnation point, high pressure, and then as I come around the cylinder, I move, I, I accelerate. I'm at my highest velocity at top, so that's going to be my lowest pressure down here, right? So I'm dropping high pressure to low as I move from here high to low. And then in an ideal world, I recover completely. I go from low to high and I go back from low to high. And if I had a perfect inviscid world, I could get all the way back to the exact same pressure. If I was to draw a line, right? That represented front to back like this, right? This left side and this right side are symmetric. So there'd be no drag. Right? Every force on this side is balanced by one on this side in this inviscid world. But this is not possible as soon as we put in viscosity, just like this is not possible as if you think of this as a hill and a ball rolling down a hill. In an inviscid world, the ball would go down and come all the way back up. But once you put in viscosity, it has not enough energy to make it back up. And a similar concept could be applied here, right? Think about we're going from, <coughs> we call this part here, a favorable pressure gradient because we're going from high to low. Imagine this high pressure at my back pushing me towards low pressure. That's easy. I don't have to do anything. It just takes me along for the ride. But this portion over here is called an adverse pressure gradient. And that's because I'm going from low to high. So the high pressure is in front of me, low behind me, and I'm trying to move into that pressure. I have to put in work. And if I have viscosity, friction, right, taking away some of my energy, then I will not have enough energy left to make it all the way back, right? Because I'm losing some to friction on the way down and on the way back. So I won't make it. And of course, this isn't really a hill. So, you know, it's not going to look exactly like this. So we won't make it as high. But in fact, the whole shape of this curve will change somewhat. And it will look something like this, right? So it actually get quite as low. It won't speed up quite as much. The whole pressure field is altered. But what happens is uh, I'm coming around stagnation. Right, and I'm accelerating around, but as I come, especially on the back side, is where I get the biggest change, that I go from this low pressure, and I'm trying to get back to high. Remember, I'm putting in work, I'm losing energy as I do that, and I've already lost a bunch of viscosity. At some point, I have no more forward momentum. My velocity is completely depleted, and so I can't continue along the surface. I'm gonna separate, okay? So we call that separation. And, I'm gonna get awake. So now I've separated, I'm gonna start mixing with the surrounding fluid, I'm gonna get this wake. And as you can see, this does not make it anywhere close to where I wanted to go. So now I've got this high pressure up front and a lower pressure behind. So I've got this net force of drag. Uh, and as I separate earlier, I get this bigger wake and I'm just gonna have more drag, okay? Uh, we're going to look at that same plot, but notice that I took the axis and I put a minus sign. So everything just got flipped over. We'll see why I do that in a second, because now we're gonna look at a streamlined shape, an airfoil. So here's an airfoil. It's at an angle of attack. Um, and notice that there are two curves now, not one. And the reason for that is that the cylinder was symmetric. So there actually are two curves here, but they look exactly the same, right? Because whether I go around this way or this way, everything is the same. But for an airfoil, if I go around the top surface versus the bottom, I get different curves. And so if we think about this, here's stagnation around somewhere here. I'm going to accelerate around the nose here. So I get really high speeds, low pressure. That's going to be this curve here, right? Because remember, this is a minus CP by convention for airfoils. This is just how we plot things in aerodynamics, minus CP. That I get a low pressure, and then I recover the high pressure. And the reason why we plot it this way is you can see that going around this upper surface corresponds to this upper plot. And so this is just a convenience. We like to visualize these where the upper part of the plot corresponds to the upper part. 
of the airflow and the lower part of the plot corresponds to the lower part. So to make that happen, we plot minus CP. Okay, so again, the upper surface I go around high to low to high, that's this part here. Whereas on the bottom, I have a stagnation uh, and I get a little bit higher pressure and then I come back to a lower pressure right uh, back here at the back. But mainly we're gonna focus here on the upper surface for right now. Um, well, actually this, I was not quite correct what I said. The stagnation is actually here, right? So actually all of this is really the upper surface. We get to a higher pressure, or sorry, lower pressure as we accelerate. The same thing happens on the lower surface. We get to a stagnation here and the lower surface starts here. I accelerate also, just not as much. So I get to a lower pressure and then we come back at the end. All right, so let's focus on this, this upper surface though. Uh, notice that I get almost all of my acceleration pretty early on, and that's pretty typical, and there are reasons why I wanna do that, but you could also see that this front is the most cylinder-like, right? So I'm getting a lot of curvature there. So that's where I get a lot of acceleration. I've gotta make a really sharp turn. So a lot of acceleration, and I get this big drop in pressure, and now, I've got to make it all the way back. And so the steeper this is, the harder it is for me because I'm going from low pressure. Remember, the higher I start from, the lower I am. And I've got to get back to this high pressure at the back end. So if this becomes really steep, I've got a long way to go. And actually, the area under this curve is proportional to my normal force. So I kind of want that to be big. But the bigger I go, right, the bigger if I push this curve up, let's say I increase the angle of attack and it becomes even steeper then I can get more lift, but I've got this even steeper pressure gradient I have to transverse and I'm more likely to separate. And at some point I will, right? As I increase the angle of attack, then it gets too high and the fluid can't make it around anymore and I'm gonna separate and then I'm gonna get a wake here. Uh, we, we'll call, we call that stall for the wing, right? That I'm gonna get a big drop in lift and a lot of drag. So, this is why we have these streamlined shapes, whereas for this blunt shape, there's just no way, right? There's too much curvature, I can't make it. But for the streamlined shape, I have a very gradual shape so I can have slow changes in pressure and I can bring it back slowly back to a relatively high pressure on the backside so that I don't have this big, huge change in pressure and a lot of associated drag. Okay, so, uh, Really briefly, uh, these are things that you've probably seen, but if you haven't, um, what we just saw, or I just mentioned, was that the lift, right? Remember, as I increase the angle of attack, this is going to come up. So I'm going to have more area in this curve, which is a bigger normal force, which means more lift. So my lift is going to increase as I increase my angle of attack. And it turns out, we'll see this, we'll actually work this out mathematically later in the semester that this is uh, linear, right? Theoret uh, theoretically and even practically, it's very linear for the most part, uh, that my lift changes linearly with angle of attack. But at some point, as we discussed, we get to too high of an angle, the body is now too blunt, right? I have too much of an adverse gradient, it's gonna separate. And uh, usually that doesn't happen like in an instant, but there's kind of a slower drop. And then I, sometimes it's very quick, but then I get this stalling behavior where my lift starts dropping precipitously. Okay, so this is what a lift curve typically looks like um, over this linear region. We call this the zero lift angle of attack because it's the angle of attack that produces zero lift. So in this linear region, we could say that the lift coefficient is proportional to the angle of attack, right? This is just the equation of a line, right? And it's got this offset because of zero. So when the angle of attack equals alpha naught, then my lift is zero, uh, but it just increases linearly from there. After stall, right, it's obviously no longer linear, but for this linear portion, we could get this relatively simple expression. Um, so this curve, and actually this slope, as we'll see, uh, is about two pi. We'll derive that. It's a uh, practically it's a little bit less, but theoretically it's two pi. Um, this is pretty much the same kind of slope for any airfoil. For different airfoils, this zero lift angle of attack will change. This whole curve will shift around. The stalling behavior will change, like where it initiates and how rapid it initiates. But this linear portion, right, shifted around, is pretty much universal. Whether we have 
a flat plate or a, a really fancy airfoil. Um, and that's because these are all real, still real relatively thin and we'll, we'll again, we'll derive this a bit later. Uh, but the reason, so then you could ask, well, why don't we just have them to be very thin? And we, and, and sometimes we do, birds do, not all birds, but some birds have very thin airfoil sections, right? Instead of a curve shape like this, they might have something that's very thin, right? So, I mean, perhaps even with a lot of camber, but uh, it works well for birds because they dynamically change their shape very quickly. And so the, the, the reason why we have this round shape primarily is that it's more robust, right? So that, um, let's say this is my, the direction my fluid's coming, uh, whether it comes this way or this way or this way, I've got kind of this rounded shape. And so I can still kind of navigate a wide range of angles of attack without stalling. Whereas the sharp shape, you know, if I have this kind of ideal angle of attack, things come around nicely and I can curve around and stay attached. But if I deviate too much, let me just do it with a different color, I deviate too much. Now I've got this super steep, right? Because this is a, such a sharp shape, this really sharp curve I need to navigate. And that just becomes too adverse of a gradient and I'm gonna separate, right? So birds can handle that because they can, as this flow changes, they can change their feathers, right? Or their wings to match that shape. But for large structures, right? The inertia is too big and we don't do that. So typical solution is to round this out so it can be more robust. Okay, and then the last thing today, uh, drag, polar. Um, this is the same kind of thing that we're just, instead of plotting lift coefficient, we're plotting drag coefficient. And I, maybe I should just mention this. Uh, the 2D versions, right? We use a lowercase. So this is a force per unit length because it's in 2D. It's a dynamic pressure. And we don't have an area because this is a force per unit length, so we don't have, uh, we're missing one length, so this is not an area, this is just a length, so usually a cord length, like an airfoil. Same with a drag coefficient. It's a drag per unit length, unit span, or whatever, unit distance into the page, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, same kind of deal. So what does drag look like versus angle of attack? Well, it's typically relatively quadratic in form. Uh, maybe not exactly, but it certainly has that kind of behavior. Um, sometimes a little flatter, sometimes there's actually more than one sort of hump there. Uh, but this is a pretty typical behavior. Uh, often we actually plot this versus lift coefficient instead of angle of attack. But um, as we've seen for most of the range, those two things are linearly related. So it'll look, I mean, the numbers won't be the same on the axis, but the, the character of the curve will be more or less the same. And then as we get towards stall, this you know, rises very precipitously. Okay, so that's it for right now. We're gonna do a little bit of math review next time.